coming. First things first, uh, let me just start my uh, captivity timer. So how long I've got you guys for. Uh, then you're free. You can go outside, play in the grass and the mud, whatever you want to do. Uh, I'm not going to judge. Okay, so um, what we're going to look at today are these synchronization primitives, right? And the talk, I've tried to simplify it as much as I can. It is a bit of a tricky topic, a bit of a challenging thing. So um, we're going to go through quite slowly. Uh, we're going to introduce things uh, at a, a, with a sort of problem approach. So we'll have a new problem, and then we'll look at one of these things that I'll talk about in a minute, synchronization primitives, and see how we might be able to solve that problem, hopefully with code that's not full of concurrency bugs. So that's the plan. Uh, right then, let's let's begin. So the title, synchronization primitives, let's start by unpacking that. I think that's a good place to start. So when we're talking about primitives, we're not talking about cavemen, early hunter-gatherers, okay? We're talking about something that is, I might put some words on here, okay, some sort of synonyms, um, something that in the context of programming language we're thinking about things that are i've said irreducible we can't really break them down into anything smaller uh really they're sort of supposed to be used as those kind of quite small compact little units um there's something that are fundamental um they are building blocks okay and uh, sort of always available you've always got something like that in these kind of languages so that's what we're talking about when i say primitive in the context of uh of languages so a lot of languages you you hear the term primitive types is a good example java c plus plus python we tend to use built-in if you search java primitive uh, python primitive types will come up um python built-ins so i think you meant that um so what are some examples well i mean we've got the fundamental types we've got in float complex and we've got some functions as well you know some length these kind of things so you know you can't really break them down in the sense, you know, they do what they do. They're a sort of unit of work um, and they're available, right? They're always there for when you need them. So the slightly more challenging word, synchronization. So the goal of this is in the context of concurrency. And we'll talk a little bit about what we mean about concurrency in just a minute. As programmers, we love determinism we like to write code and we like to see it do exactly what we are expecting it to do so a lot of these primitives the idea behind the synchronization is removing or um, creating that sort of removing non-deterministic so the term they usually use is um, indeterminism in the context of of synchronization um, it's going to be things about access control, which is, we'll talk about mutual exclusion. I'll break that down in a bit. Um, and so controlling the flow, you know, what should happen when, uh, and again, the context is all about these concurrent um, programs. So together then, as a sort of definition, I've said a fundamental element, a synchronization primitive, a fundamental element of a language, okay, that allows us to solve these problems or challenges of synchronization so that's what it's about so as i said what exactly are we synchronizing synchronize is a bit of a relative term yeah you synchronize something so it's all about the concurrency whether it's with threads threads to threads uh coroutines to coroutines or processes to processes all these things can run concurrently okay which is what well, you've got parallel and then you've got concurrent, but we're going to look at concurrent first. So if you imagine you've got a simple program, okay, don't read into the type apps too much. It's just a line, okay, like the area, nothing under it. So you've got a simple program, yeah, you've got all your code, your instructions, this kind of stuff, and it's a synchronous flow, yeah? You can see on time, in this example, and nothing's interrupting it. You can imagine on like a single machine with a single CPU and a single core, okay? And then when we want to try a hand run multiple programs well the sort of first slice to hear is you've got your program a b c and they're all sort of one after the next and the next and what we can do is we can bro break down things into these sort of jobs or tasks and this is the key bit really of concurrency it's not to do with threads or coroutines but it's all about breaking things down in the classical sense into these sort of tasks 
how these are implemented underneath, whether they're using threads as the kind of main block unit or processes or whatever, that's more of an implementation side of it. So here we've got, we've broken down those three, you know, A, A, C. The order they run in, well, it's going to depend on scheduling, what kind of algorithms you've got. Um, and the operating system is going to take care of a lot of that anyway. So there's a little difference then. You know, a typical process, um, when you create a new process, you get everything in this box, all right? You get new data for the program. You've got, uh, you've got your new code, you know, that made up of instructions, all right? Stack, registers, you essentially you get a really nice copy of everything you've got. So when we're thinking about synchronizing between processes you've got to imagine that data that we are sharing from any of these portions really between different processes um, and typically you've got things called ipc interprocess communication um, and that's where these primitives are going to come into play so threads are kind of what i'm just going to use for some of these examples because it's i think most people understand the idea of a thread i think probably for this talk so a thread's a bit different um, we don't copy everything you know you can think about it in the evolution of things you know very originally you'd have your program your process and you would just sort of copy everything and then people say well actually you could be a little bit more efficient if you look at things we don't need to copy everything perhaps to get what we want so here we've got you know a new stack and the registers but we can share that data between these threads and that's the important thing this global data that's what we're going to be looking at when we're thinking about the access control so just, um, that was a mistake there. Yeah. And then finally, just sort of said it here in an event loop as well, you know, in a single threaded, um, context, all right, core, cool. you know, you, things can be concurrent without being in parallel. Okay. And that's the key thing here. Parallel. I mean, here literally running at the exact same time. It doesn't have to be, to be concurrent. If you break things up into tasks it will seem very cleverly like it is running at the same time. I mean, the computer's so, so fast, you're not really going to notice, um, you know, very originally, you know, this is sort of what the, the approach was before we had uh, more high-level abstractions as uh, processes and, and threads. So the first primitive we're going to look at is, I think, probably the oldest one. It's the classic one um, created by uh, Edsger Dijkstra, absolute... Um, contender i think for a final boss in computer science i mean a lot of stuff in mathematics um computer science for a tim sadly uh, no longer with us but a lot of his work is instrumental to lots of things we do today so the semaphore really it's about that resource resource control and what it's going to help us do is exactly thinking back to what we just saw with the shared data or the uh the global and local you know all these things between processes or sharing that data between coroutines. It's going to help us with determining the order that we're running things in, removing that indeterminism, which is a real problem when we're trying to run things concurrently. Um, you've got a couple types of semaphore. You've got binary and counting. We'll talk about that later. Um, you've got more actually, but no spoilers. So just as a rough idea, we've got two functions on a semaphore, two things that we can do with it. We've got this acquire and release. Now, all languages are a bit different. It essentially, it's up to whoever, you know, in the committee and whoever built it in that language to decide what wording they want to use. Uh, often you can have wait instead of acquire or signal instead of release, which is a bit of a hint of what they're supposed to do. You would also have post instead of signal and again, wait uh, instead of acquire. So if we try and imagine what a, a semaphore is, okay, if we sort of imagine this kind of pseudo-y Python code, it's all about a value, a count. That's essentially at the core. And this count represents the resources that we have available or we don't have available. So classically, you will set that initial value, as you can see there, it's defaulted to one, that's the the Python one. And what this is indicating when you create a semaphore is currently how many resources are available. That's the important thing. Um, you could call it count, you could call it number, val, it doesn't really matter. The point is it's an integer value. Um, it's not negative. 
So it's you can think of it as an unsigned positive integer. Uh, it's zero, one, or many. Okay, we can't initialize it as negative. Um, it's an interesting question what you would get if you did, which is maybe a thing for an extension. So that's just our semaphore. It's really simple. That's the only state that's being managed inside it. So with our release, this is really our signaling. So thinking again between different threads or processes or the coroutines, we're saying here a resource has become available. That's all. Really, really simple. We're just incrementing the count. But I've called it resources to hopefully keep it quite, uh, quite simple. And wait or acquire is a little bit more complicated. So what it's doing really is it's looking at that resource value. Okay. And so this is an, an exact implementation. Of course, this is just a, a rough idea of what's happening here. And if that value is for some reason, you know, less or zero, okay, well, we've got no resources. So what do we do? I mean, a couple of options. You could either just keep looping forever because you don't want it to continue. You want it to stop. You want it to stop. You could just keep looping forever. Not really very efficient way of doing it. Um, or you could say, okay, I want my thread or my process or my coroutine to effectively sleep. I just want it to wait. Yeah. And I want it to wait until it's signaled that it's ready. Okay. So that's the core idea. And then afterwards, when it has woken up from that sleep, after the counter has become one or more, all it does is it says, cool. Got it. I'm going to decrement the resource because we now have one um, and we've effectively acquired it, right? So acquiring resources, we're waiting for them to be available. Releasing, we are releasing one into the wild and um, signaling that it is available. Okay. So the first problem then we're going to think about is imagine you've got two threads, all right, thread A and B. And thread A has some code. I've called it first. It doesn't matter. But we want it to run. That's, that's the point. Thread B, we want to make sure that it runs second. That's our condition here. That's what we want to achieve. So I've said there, we want to make sure first always runs before second. It doesn't really matter what we're doing. It's just about what kind of algorithm we want, what kind of output, the, the deterministic result that we want to achieve. Okay. Just as like a visual representation, just kind of think about it. You've got your first thread, it will run, it will execute first to a certain point, and then it will signal, it will release a resource, yeah, to the second thread. And then on the other side, just a, a different way of looking at it, you know, you've got your, you can imagine that kind of invisible barrier that's sort of holding that second thread there. And it's saying, well, just hold on, hold on a minute. When you've been signaled, you can go. All right. So that's just a different way of, of picturing it, really. So we've got our thread, you know, little dot in there. We've got our code. We've got two threads here. You've got your stacks, your registers, all right? And you've got the shared data that's between them. So this is the, uh, that's the important bit. We're not looking at accessing that data yet. We'll get to it. But for now, what we want to do is we want to make sure thread A runs before thread B. So we're going to use our semaphore. So we create it. It's going to be a shared thing. Yeah, they both need access to that. You can't make one in because they won't have that. You know, they both need to be incrementing or decrementing the resource value. So one way we can do this, or the simple way, really, what we do is we allow thread A to run the code. And when it's done, we signal, we release, we say a resource is available. While thread B is waiting to begin with. Yeah, we don't want it to run yet. We just say, wait until you've reached, you've received that signal and then we continue. So what initial value do you think we need to set for the semaphore here for this to work? Anybody shout something out? Yeah? What? One. Okay. So let's have a thing. So what we're saying, if we're one, we have a resource available. Okay. So let's say thread B runs first. It tries to acquire. It's waiting. We think back to the... Well, the resource is one, right? Uh, so it's not going to sleep. It's just going to continue. So actually what would happen if we set it to one is it would just execute straight away. And it unfortunately wouldn't work. 
So what we need to do is actually set it to zero, all right, which is a little strange, but so what happens is in this case, if we say there are no resources and thread B runs first, well, there's zero resources, so it waits, it just sleeps. If thread A runs first, well, that's fine because it runs that bit, the first bit, and then it signals that it's done. So indeed, yeah, we need to set it to zero as that, that initial value. Now, having two threads, one A signal B is fairly simple and perhaps not the most practical. And probably you want to be able to have something a bit more like this, where you're signaling lots of threads. And the issue we have with this algorithm, so we've got the signaler, yeah, and we've got waiter one and waiter two. It's just not quite going to work. And the reason is, if you think about it, as soon as that signaler runs and we set it to zero, it gives one resource. So only one of those waiters will actually run, which is not quite what we want, right? So, um, well, I mean, what could we do here? You need to say there are more resources available, right? I mean, that's a simple way. We just say, okay, release once, signal once, signal again, okay? Not really the best pattern you know you could end up with so you've got n threads and you're sort of thinking okay you know you're gonna to have to do a loop of n threads that you want to then wake up uh, as it happens release does accept a number for how many things that you want to how many resources you want to make available which is helpful here because we don't have to then do a loop okay uh which is good but there are other synchronization primitives that are more suited to solving the problem when we have multiple. And the one we're going to look at first is the event. Okay. So the event is a specialization of what we've just looked at, really. It's got a set value, which is synonymous. It's similar to the idea of signaling. We set that the events happened. And here it's called wait. That's what it's called in the in the Python. So this makes it much easier. You've got some clear, you've got other things as well. So if you want to like clear, get rid of the event and allow it to restart, it's just easier if you're looping and all these other kinds of patterns. But you, know, you can search it up, have a look for some of those yourself. So in this case, we just simply were using our event instead. We don't need an initial value with the event. Yeah, it's more sort of powerful in that sense. It just understands, it manages that under the scenes. So we've got our first code and just like we released, we signal, we just do set. And our second one, we wait. Okay, so it's the same pattern just with the event. But when we have multiple, well, we can also call wait. So here we've got waiter one and waiter two, just both wait on the same event. So we've already removed that kind of a little bit nasty logic of having to release multiple times to, uh, to handle uh, multiple threads you know n number of threads we don't have to even have a count anymore of for our algorithm we don't need to know how many threads there are as long as they're running the same function or again or coroutines or processes as long as they're, in, they're using that weight and we signal from an outside thread process whatever then we can be sure that they're all going to be woken up the order that they run in after that well that's we can't guarantee that all we're saying here is that they've reached that point, and once they've all reached that, only after they've been signaled will they go. The order, we can't control that. It's up to the scheduler. So an evolution of this problem is called the rendezvous problem. And we're going to start with two threads again. And this time, the big difference is that we don't want to have a thread that is signaling. We just want to have thread A and thread B both reach a point and then continue. So we've removed this idea of actually you know, setting or signaling the event. They should just both run. And once they've reached a certain point, only then can they actually continue. And that's what we want to do, basically. So you can picture that visually as uh, you've got your kind of barrier there, yeah? All the threads are going to reach that rendezvous. Once they're all there, great, let them continue. So let's start with the semaphore again. I've just called it after B and after A. So obviously thread needs to make sure, thread A, sorry, needs to make sure that runs after B has reached that, that point in the code. And thread B needs to make sure that thread A has reached that point in the code. 
So how can we do this with our with our semaphore? So the thing is, we're actually going to need two here. It's a little bit more complicated because we need to, both of them are going to need to effectively wait for the other one to be done. It's a little bit weird. So we create two, and I've called them A sem, B sem, doesn't really matter. All right. Um, both are going to be zero. Okay, same idea as last time. When, because if any of them runs first, it's got to be waiting. Yeah, we can't just let it go. It's got to wait until the other one, sort of that crossing of the, the signals, signals it. So perhaps the obvious thing we start with, okay, we just wait on each one. Great. Okay. Well, that's fantastic, but nothing's actually going to run after that because nothing's signaling. So the solution to this is we actually, we signal first, and this is a bit weird. And the idea here is that we have done all the stuff we want to do. Um, we signal to the other thread effectively that A has reached that point, And then it waits on B to reach that point as well. So yeah, I appreciate it's a little difficult to read with it, but notice the important thing is it's a different semaphore. Here, it's not ASEM, ASEM, it's ASEM is waiting, is signaling B that it's ready, B signals A that it's ready, and then they both wait on each other. So if you think through it, really, imagine, um, you know, thread A's first, and um, it runs, it signals, thread B as then catches up, okay, it's done the bit we want, it's signaled, thread A is still waiting on B, it hasn't received the signal yet, thread B gets there and it signals and we're done, okay? So what we've ensured is that they're all going to reach a certain point. So really sweating it. <laughs> all going to reach a certain point, and then we let them continue. So pretty cool, really. But is this going to work for multiple? Yeah, I think it's a common theme here that it's sometimes quite easy to come up with solutions for just two things. But then when we try and generalize it, it does get a little bit more complicated. Now. If we think about the event, well, we could just set all of the waiters on wait, but it's not quite the same because one of them has got to call set from somewhere else. So it's not quite the same problem or the same constraint that we had before where all of them are, you know, there's no one that's different. They're all using that same kind of pattern. Um, okay, so that's that's sort of the rendezvous. We're going to look at later how you solve the multiple problem because we're going to need something a little bit more complicated to do that, which is why we're introducing the mutual exclusion problem first. It's always a bit of a rabbit hole with this. You often need one problem to solve another one, which will then help you solve a more complicated version of the original problem. Mutual exclusion then. Okay, so the problem is we've got two threads again, thread A, thread B. Uh, thread A has a, a section, we're going to call it critical section, as does thread B. Um, and what these critical sections are representing are the shared data between these threads, the shared things, or in the case of processes, it could be anything, you know, in one process that it's trying to use in another one, that they both are able to change, to edit, to write to, to read from. And the same in coroutines as well, you know. Although we've got um, cooperative scheduling in coroutines, the more complex things get and your awaits and your yields, importantly not just await, will create those gaps and those breaks. But we'll look at that in a minute. So the key thing here, the problem that we're trying to solve is that only th one thread must be running that particular bit at a time. Now, in our previous ones, when the semaphores wake up, well, it's just sort of multiple, you know, there's nothing that's guaranteeing here that you know, all of those things that were waiting just run in whatever order. They could run in parallel if that's actually possible, but they might run, you know, they're going to run concurrently anyway. So uh, here's just a visual idea. Yeah, we've got two threads. They both need to access that shared data, that critical section. Only one of them can read or write to that data at a time, and then they're allowed to continue. So as a sort of example here, I think to make this a little bit more obvious as the, the problems, the issues of what happens if we don't. So let's say we've got two threads, all right, and there's a really simple 
function and we just want to we just want to add one to a counter okay and it's running twice so the value we should get would be two yeah hopefully fairly simple <laughs> so the issue that we get is if you kind of break it down here sort of line by line and i appreciate it's a bit of a complicated probably impossible to see at the back but the point really what we're getting at is that depending on where these breaks are, what gets run at what points, the state can be different. So on the left side here, imagine that we've just read that value, the shared count value, okay? And we saw we're at the start, so it's zero. Great. And then we do our increment. If the other thread, right, has already reached certain points, so if you think about it here, um, so it adds one to the local count, okay? So this one reaches that dotted line. And then all of a sudden, the other one just manages to complete all the way through. So that's now set it to one because it's incremented it. And here, now we start running again. And well, the local count was set to zero because we read it earlier. So then we set the final value and it's one. Or oh, sorry, it's, um, it's one, yeah. So the point here is, is what's called a race condition. It's a little bit difficult to illustrate these sometimes, but the, the key point really is that it's that inconsistent state and it's that danger that um, we can set things or make changes that are going to have effects to introduce that indeterminism. So I said, yeah, race condition, a situation where result outcomes are determined by factors outside the control of the program's logic. So, you know, what order things run in, what order they were accessed, how we wrote to them, this kind of stuff. Um, in our case, often it with timing, timing issues here. So, I mean, what about the GIL? Okay, the global interpreter lock. In the, in the case of threads, you know, we hear this a lot. And, uh, well, it, what it's doing is it's protecting the internal uh, interpreter code. Okay, when you're writing things, you know, in, in C Python specifically for this, it's making sure that when threads, because these are real threads, you know, that Python is running, when they need to access the interpreter functions, you know, the pre-made C Python, uh, C code, it's making sure that the shared data structures and all of that stuff is synchronized, yeah, that that stuff is safe to access. It's not making a guarantee that your python code right that might look like a single line but actually gets broken down into multiple byte code that the python virtual machine effectively executes it's not guaranteeing that that will run you know protected essentially so it's absolutely possible that maybe after this it doesn't really matter about the what these mean you know the point is is that it's not unfortunately as simple as we just have a single line in Python, and that means it's in a single threaded context, it's going to work. Now, a lot of the times it does, you know, I think Python is very quick and depending on the size of what exactly you're doing. Yeah, so don't be surprised if it does work. But the point is, it there's no guarantee that it will. Um, and originally, you were able to set a value in the interpreter of how many instructions you could run effectively before that kind of switch. But now it works a bit differently with a sort of more, more efficient uh, algorithm now. So solving this problem then with semaphores, well, we've got our critical sections and we want to make sure that only one thread is accessing these at a time. So here, the person said, well, we do need one here. Okay. So what's happening is the first time we reach it, we want to try and acquire, there's only one resource available. That's what we're thinking here in terms of the access. Only one thing is able to get in here at a time. So we set that initial value to one. Once we've acquired it, nothing else can get it because it will, the other thread, whatever, whichever one it is, order we don't know, it's gonna find that this resource count is zero because the other one got it first, it minus one, and then effectively it's gonna block, it's gonna wait, it's gonna sleep, okay? We do the critical section and when we're done, we make sure that we release. Yeah, we have to signal that there's now a resource available. So that's effectively the pattern here. When, when you're using semaphores, all right, uh, acquire and release, you know, around that critical section. 
but we have more specialized tools to do this specifically. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of a lock, okay, you know, in threaded code. Um, and the idea here is it's really specializing. The job it's trying to solve is that mutual exclusion, okay? It has a simple acquire, a simple release, where the idea is, you know, we lock that bit, that bit of our code to make sure that it's only one thing is accessing it at a time. So you've got locks and you've got R locks as well, which are re-entrant locks. We'll talk about that. Hopefully we've got some time. But yeah, important point, mutual exclusion, that's the problem it's trying to solve. Yes, the semaphore can solve that problem. But when it comes to sort of lower level, you know, there's always, there's often more efficient ways to implement things underneath, um, which kind of inspires, I think, a lot of time, these sort of specialist tools, these use cases. And it's a lot simpler that you have a tool just to do what you want, rather than using something just in many, many different ways, although you can. So, uh, here we just switch out the semaphore for a lock. It's the same words. That's the nice thing about all of these in Python. It's just acquire and release. That's it. Very, very simple. We lock, we do what we're going to do on that shared data in there in that critical section. Um, and then we release as simple as that. So and the one issue we've got is imagine if you had a lock, all right, and you, you've said it, okay, internally, you can think of it as one, all right, and you acquire it and then you acquire it again. Well, the issue you're gonna have is something called deadlock. So the reason is that you're trying to wait for a resource that has already just been claimed, which you can think of the resource count as zero. So what's gonna happen where well, you're just gonna sleep on that thread or the coroutine is just gonna pause there forever. All right, so it's a bit of a problem. So the pattern is always, you know, we make sure that there's a matching acquire and release pair. Yeah, that's the important thing. They don't both have to be in the same thread. We'll talk about that in a minute. So here, we've got this shared lock. So you could do acquire in this one, forget the rest, and do release in that one. We can do that in Python. Other languages you can't because they have a, a mutex, which is slightly different. We'll talk about that if we got time i realize we're abs I'm absolutely taking forever there's so much stuff um so often you might have situation where you've got lots of locks and you've got either the classic example is you've got some recursion it calls itself okay and then if you think about this problem well you've called the same function you've just acquired it you've called it again and you've acquired and you've blocked yeah you've got this problem where you can't go any uh you, you essentially you, you sleep so you can't do anything and another way as well, another issue with this is you've got maybe two different functions and perhaps you want both of them to be used externally, you know, expose both of them and they both use the same lock. Yeah, checking the length of the list in this case and that one makes sure that when we put something into the list and if we use this function in that one, um, well, we've got if size, we're going to have the same problem where we've just tried to acquire again. So one solution for this, of some algorithms, some ways we use things, is that R lock that I mentioned before, re-entrant locks. And the idea is you can call acquire multiple times. Yeah, so you can essentially what it will do is it will just allow it to continue um, and ensure that there's still that uh, element of mutual exclusion. So briefly, we've got the Python lock. So can we release, can we signal from... Uh, like from any other thread. Yes, we can in Python. It doesn't have to be so the, the basic lock, the same thread that we acquired it. Thread A could, could acquire, thread B can release. We can do that in Python. The R lock, we can't do that. It has a new idea of ownership. Whatever calls acquire must be the same thread that calls release, which is similar to the concept of a mutex in other languages. That's kind of what we're familiar with, C, C++, Java. The rule there is it's, def it's undefined behavior, right? If we decide to call from a different thread and we, um, we release. Um, can acquire be called more than once? Well, as I said before, in the reentrant locks, yes. The other ones, no. In languages with mutexes or mutices, you can um, set those sort of things if you want to. So with the rendezvous revisited, the, you know, a good way to solve this using our semaphores like we had before 
is we need to lock something in particular. And what we need to lock, what we need to make sure we control is actually the number of threads that we are counting to wait to make sure all of them are done. So what that kind of looks like here is we've got our rendezvous, all the threads that guarantees they've all got to that point. Yeah. And what we do is we quickly grab, we have a counter. So those are our shared variables. We've got our barrier, I've called it, which is set to zero. So whenever something calls um, await, sorry, um, await, I'm talking about, <laughs> calls um, acquire or is effectively waiting with zero. We saw that earlier. It just, it just blocks. So what happens is you imagine this on different threads, you reach the rendezvous, you increment the counter, and then the very last thread, which is why we don't need to lock here when we read the count at the end, the very last thread, if the count total is the number of threads that we're waiting, you know, all our ones that we're waiting for, then we can signal. And what happens is all of them, you think they're all waiting on the barrier for a signal to come in. We signal then all of a sudden, they sort of all start like a big chain reaction, all releasing, not exactly <laughs> atomically at the same time, but the guarantee here is they've all done that rendezvous bit before. And that particular pattern has a name, actually. It's called a turns tile when we do this acquire and release together. And you can kind of think of it here as like when you, sig when you signal, when you release, it sets off that reaction, right? This one suddenly is now free and then... It doesn't, might not necessarily be the one below. It could be, you know, the, the arrows could be any order. There's no guarantee there. But the point is they will all eventually, because of the, the value, work out to the point where they all start running. Um, so we're uh, here. Uh, what's the difference? In... I'm not sure I think it was a duplicated slide. Uh, right, yeah. So here we had, we were using the semaphore as a lock, yeah? which is what we did earlier, where we set the value to one. Only difference is we can now just use a lock object and just do the same thing. Just a bit more readable in a way, you know, you sort of, you see a lock and you think, okay, something here in this code needs to be accessed one at a time, and that's the count value. So in fact, when it comes to this problem of this rendezvous problem in a general sense, where we've got all these things we're waiting for, we actually have a specific primitive to solve that problem. It's called a barrier, quite nicely. Um, and what you do is you've got your weight, reset, and abort. I wouldn't worry too much about those, but the weight's the key one. Um, they all reach the rendezvous. They call weight. Once they're all done, so you think the value the end there is the number of threads we got, they'll all just continue. So it effectively removes all of that very difficult logic, well, potentially difficult logic, of trying to do all of this with you know, semaphores and locks. Python's very good, you know, and other languages too. You often have a specific tool to solve that kind of problem. Um, another problem we got is this, I've called bounded and limit problem. So imagine you have some number of threads and rather than one that needs to run at a time, you want to make sure that 10, only 10 can run or only three can run or four or whatever. Now, the solution we saw to them, the locking earlier, we wanted one thing to run, so we set it to one. So very simply here, we can set our semaphore to that value, to some limit, and then that means that all of the, only that number of threads, processes, coroutines can run that at the time. The important thing is they're not mutually exclusive, okay? That if you have data in there and it's shared, it's not guaranteeing that they're gonna be accessed um, one at a time. It's saying that they could be completely parallel concurrent on that date at the same time. But it's very useful in async code. Often you have problems where you want to make sure you're not sort of going a bit silly and having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, callbacks executing. You want to sort of rate limit and this kind of stuff. That's where it's quite useful. Um, and one issue with that is sometimes, you know, in some code, it is possible to call another signal by accident here, you know, we got on the thread C and um, we have a, a special version of the semaphore um, called the bounded semaphore. And the only difference is that if we do for some reason call, you know, there's not a matching pairing, it just raises a value. Yeah, which is often, it's very rare to be honest that you would want to have some logic where you are releasing with the semaphore more. That turnstile thing was one where you sort of, 
Actually, no, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Yeah, because you signal once and then you end up releasing one more time than is a perfect count or one less or whatever it is. The point is it's different. But here, the bounded semaphore, you know, you set it to three and it just makes sure that, yeah, definitely three things run and you're not also calling it by mistake. So semaphore summary, you got what's called a binary one, which is when we set it to one. It can have either zero or one as that value. That was what we used to solve the lock. Yeah, so we've got, you know, threading, async, and multiple processing. We've got the counting semaphore, which is that bounded problem. So we just set it to whether value we want, and we just make sure we can run things um, all sort of together to a limit. Um, and then we've got the bounded semaphore, sorry, uh, which was the specific one where it does raise the error and things like that. In some languages, you have a time semaphore. Uh, and what that does is after a certain points in time, it just releases everything. Python doesn't doesn't have that, but, um, but I'm sure it's not too too tricky if you wanted it. Quite niche, really. So the tools we've looked at, at least as far as I can get to, I think in the talk, unfortunately, um, is for signaling. You know, we got events, right? We got locks, we got barriers, um, and um, yeah. So I don't have time, I think, to talk about any more. But I will share the slides. There was quite a lot of stuff. Um, and what I was going to talk about, at least I was going to go through, there's another problem called the producer-consumer. And you've got these uh, cues and this kind of stuff. And um, how you solve that with the semaphores, introduce a new primitive called the condition variable, an easy way to think about it. Talk a little bit about the differences of the semaphore and the condition variable in terms of how we think. We're going to talk about the pattern. So just at least if you read through these later, you've got some idea here. You can look at the pattern of how you use these condition variables, a little bit of refactoring there, um, how you then solve that problem with the uh, condition variables with that uh, producer and consumer. And again, a little bit of refactor. See, I had a lot here, actually. I completely... Uh, let it go away with me. Um, then I was going to look at built-in queues. I wasn't done. I was going to look at built-in queues and how you can use those instead. Then I was going to show an example of how you would turn a blocking threading call into async. Yeah, which is a really good problem that you can solve with queues. Um, and I still wasn't done. For the last one, <laughs> I was going to show you how you could, if you only had like a mutex where you've got that constraint of locking and unlocking from a single thread, how you could implement like a Python lock effectively if you just had the mutex constraint. So it just here's the R lock, okay? And then just the other slides show that basically a, a very rough idea of how you would do that based on how the, the C Python approaches that problem. If the semaphore is available, we've seen it's very, very easy. We just do that, but it's a little bit more complicated to make sure that idea of ownership isn't present in that case. Um, and then I really was done. That really was the end. I had the summary of problems, like two minutes, um, summary of what we maybe might have talked about, and then a, a thank you. So that's, I think that I'll end it there. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for that very um, deep dive and as a token of appreciation from oh, the organizers. Wow, thank you. Here you go. Oh, you so Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A, but oh, I'm no, sure no, no. they can contact. Come speak to me if you want to. In yeah. person. So the next um, um, talk would be in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for eight. Well, I learned a lot.